good teacher. I'm going to tap into your prior knowledge. All right. I know you have it. In Genesis, God made a promise to Abraham. What was that promise that God made to Abraham? I'm going to make you into a great nation. That's right. And he said, I'm going to give you a special piece of real estate too, right? The promised land, right? What we call Israel, centered around Jerusalem. And he confirmed that promise to Isaac and Jacob. Isaac is son, Jacob is grandson. Now Jacob got the name Israel. He got renamed um, the name Israel, which is how we come up with Israelites and, and Israel. Um, Jacob, or Israel, had 12 sons, right? And the, probably the most significant one was, this is my little mini quiz, you know, here. Who, what was his name? Joseph. Joseph, that's right. And Joseph had a unique life, in fact, um, he ended up in Egypt and second in command in Egypt when there was a famine. And so Jacob's uh, family, the 11 brothers, minus Joseph, were back in the, 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 the promised land, if you will. But because of the famine, they went to Egypt and they lived in a place called Goshen. In fact, at the end of Genesis, Genesis 46, 27, we'll bring this up on the screen here. All the persons in the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. Now I have a map for you, so you can see, we'll refer to this map a few times, okay? Um, way up on the left, the lower Egypt, you see the word Goshen. That's where they live. That's where the Israelites started with 70 people in Goshen. And they stayed in that area for 400 years. That's where they lived. Abraham was actually told by God that they would be there for 400 years, and it wouldn't be a pleasant 400 years. In fact, if I take you to Genesis 15 real quick here, verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, and will be servants there. Okay, they weren't servants when they went there, because Joseph was second in command to the Pharaoh. But they will be afflicted for 400 years. I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. That's Egypt. And afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. If you read in Exodus, right, you know that they plundered the Egyptians. They took all of their stuff. And this is what Abraham heard from God 400 years, actually many years before it ever happened. This is where Exodus began. All right, this is where we see that the nation of Israel starts with 70 people. And over the course of 400 years, they grew to estimated about 2.1 million people. So now, in, living in Egypt is 2.1 million people. Can you imagine that? Enslaved to the Egyptians. Every day, living in fear, working for them, in bondage, every day. Many people live right now in fear and bondage. We are afraid of many things. Kids fear shots, monsters under the bed, and vegetables on their plates. <laughs> Am I right? Teens suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. Social media does a great job of presenting FOMO, fear of missing out. Also, they fear losing their precious Phones. Yeah. My precious. <laughs> right? Don't you think that sometimes when you see teens with their phones? Adults, we hear all kinds of things like global warming, corrupt government, <laughs> terrorists, losing our job, and probably the worst, losing someone we really care about, we love. Many people are living in fear every day, and sometimes we become a slave to our fears. Not willing, maybe you are willing to admit it, maybe you're not. But are you living a slave to fear? If that is holding you back, if fear is holding you back, I hope today will help. I hope the message from Exodus will give you hope and show you the way out. Would you be interested in that? Would you like that? To know the way out. It's actually what the word Exodus means. It means a way out. And in fact, the theme verse, if you will, of this whole <coughs> book of Exodus as I try, and it's very difficult, and I don't do it justice in one message, but I try to cover the theme of this, that in Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out 
of the house of slavery. Again, this whole book is about redemption, delivering the people of God out of their bondage to the slavery. I believe the Bible has all the answers that you seek in life. I know people look in all different places for answers, but I believe the Word of God has them for you. It's a constant help for you, and not just in the New Testament. I was joking earlier with some that the New Testament, we kind of, we don't mind reading that. We like to read the New Testament, right? How many of you have at least read the New Testament or many books in the New Testament, right? We like it. But the Old Testament? <laughs> I don't really want to read about the Old Testament. Sometimes people are afraid of it. But I, you have to understand that the Old Testament points to the New Testament. That together, it all <clears throat> points to Jesus. It's a wonderful thing when you begin to understand how the Old Testament sets up the New Testament and it points to Jesus because Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Are you with me? Yeah. Give me a thumbs up. You're with me. All right. Throughout the Bible, we see God raises up leaders. He prepares them to do his kingdom business. But it takes time to prepare these uh, men of God and women of God. In fact, it took 40 years to prepare Moses. Are you familiar with the significance of the number 40 in the Bible? It appears almost 150 times in the Bible. The number 40 has some unique significance. It actually means a time of preparation or a time of trial. I share with you some of those numbers uh, that, that show up. Um, by the way, uh, it's kind of ironic, maybe intentional, that the book of Exodus has how many chapters? 40, that's right. Of course, Bible scholars did that. Um, but I wonder if they did it on purpose, because we see 40 a lot in the book of Exodus. Although there's other places, like Jonah the prophet, he warned in Nineveh that in 40 days, judgment would come upon them. Ezekiel, the prophet, had to lay on his right side for 40 days, one day for each year that Judah spent uh, in exile and was punished. Jesus, in his time of preparation before he started his ministry, spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights twice on Mount Sinai as God prepared the law and the Ten Commandments. Moses also spent, sent 12 men to spy on the Promised Land. For how long? 40 days. And Moses lived to be 120, three segments of 40 years each. And it's in the first 40 that we look at first. Moses was from the tribe of Levi, born into slavery in Egypt. His parents had a way of saving him because Pharaoh wanted all of the Hebrew boys to be killed when they were born. But the way of saving him was to allow him to be um, rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. So he grew up kind of in royalty, right? He uh, learned from the Egyptians, had the finest education money could buy. In fact, Stephen, the Christian martyr, the first Christian martyr, explained in his speech when, uh, before he was uh, murdered in Acts 7, 22, he says this, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. That was the education that Moses had, because the Egyptians were incredibly intelligent. I used to joke with our basketball players, the coach that I coached with, we used to joke when they would do something really mysterious in practice, like nothing we taught. <laughs> you know, they would just do something wild and weird and crazy, and we'd be like, why did you do that? I mean, that is like a mystery, like the Egyptians building the pyramids. Like, we don't get that. And they would laugh, and we would laugh with them. But it was just showing that, you know, how do you build those pyramids? I mean, what a mystery. What intelligence they had, their abilities to do that. Moses was, wow. Moses was privileged to all of that. But even with his extraordinary education, he was not prepared to lead God's people out of Egypt. Does anybody need a defibrillator? I'm sorry. I don't know what that is. That's never happened before. <laughs> All kinds of te technical problems. Um, Moses probably thought that God had put him in this royal position to rescue his people. Because over the course of 40 years, he began to realize, like, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm actually 
I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a, a, you know, the slaves. Like that's me. That's my nation. So what did he do one day? He tried to rescue his people by murdering an Egyptian. But that just got him into deeper trouble. And honestly, I believe these first 40 years, what Moses discovered more than anything is that he could not do this on his own. How many times have we learned that lesson where God teaches us, you just can't do this on your own. You need my help. Well, Moses, his answer to this was, I'm running, right? And like Forrest Gump, he ran, right? And I'll bring up the map so you can see how far he went. He fled to a place called Midian. So on this map, you see, remember, way up in the left-hand corner here is Lower Egypt with Goshen, right? That's where he is. Well, he shoots all the way across, right, the Sinai Peninsula, all the way over that second gulf down to Midian. That's where he goes. That's his hiding place. And he stays there for 40 years. He starts a family, right? He, he, he has um, um, children. And he has no intention of going back to Egypt. He's not going back there ever, in his mind. But this is where the real preparation begins. God gives him a BBD, a burning bush degree. <laughs> God speaks to him. He hears from God. He talks with God. And he gets this really cool staff <laughs> that does some neat things. If you read Exodus, you know what I'm talking about. God prepares him. Is God preparing you right now for something big. Do you feel that way about your walk with God? Like, I feel like God is preparing me right now for something big. I mentioned earlier that I did some painting here at the church. I had a, a week off from uh, school. Uh, as many of you know, I'm still a high school teacher, and uh, I had the week off, so I spent it here working. <laughs> you get your money. <laughs> you, uh, I'm working hard. Uh, for the church, but it was enjoyable. I, I, there's these projects I like to do, and I wanted to get some painting done, but I didn't want to do it by myself, so I recruited a young man. The young man uh, came up here to help me, and, and he is actually the one who painted this wall. And then he did a fantastic job on this wall back here. Yeah. Very thankful for him. I joked with him in Exodus. If you got through it, you realize there was two guys that had um, special skills to make the tabernacle and the furniture and all of that. And I was joking with him that, that God must have given him a special skill to paint that wall back there. And uh, um, I think he bought it. Uh, um, but uh, as we painted, we talked uh, quite a bit about God's Word. I'm very impressed with this young man because um, at only 19, he has memorized um, a ton of Scripture. He knows God's Word, and he's consuming it. For only being a Christian for about a year, he, he is just in, in love with God's Word. And as we talked at lunch one day, we talked about um, what does God have planned for him next? Don't we all want to know that? What does God have planned for us next? And uh, it's, a, it's a scary thought sometimes. I feel like if, if we knew what God had planned for you next, I mean, if Moses knew what was about to happen, that would scare you, wouldn't it? <laughs> So sometimes God likes to reveal his plan just one day at a time. And the best thing you can do is just wait. You feel like God is going to uh, have something big planned for you? God has a big plan. I believe that. But you just got to sometimes be still and know he's God and stay spiritually disciplined. Right? The spiritual disciplines, like renewing your mind in his word, praying continuously, and fellowshipping with one another, coming to church, connecting with one another, because as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Serving, giving your gifts and talents to God's work and building up his church. Giving faithfully. Jesus talked about it time and time again, right? Uh, where your heart is, where your money is, that's where your heart is. Stay focused on these things because I believe through these daily disciplines that we have, God prepares us to fight his battles. And I think the biggest battle that we all fight is the one in our heads. The battle that goes on in our heads. What you believe about yourself. I think God wants to win that battle. Because I don't think God gave you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. So we need to set our mind on things of love. The old saying is, garbage in, garbage out. But if you put new in, you'll get new out, and it'll be a new you. You got to play this game to win. We got to play this game to win. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right. God is prepared.
prepared us, and once he's prepared us, he sends us into battle. Moses went into Egypt to take on Pharaoh. Not on his own now, but by the power of God. And I think you'll find it interesting. Maybe you never knew this before, but you've read the ten plagues, perhaps. Or maybe you've heard of these plagues that went on. And uh, maybe you didn't understand it. You thought, well, this is a little strange. Why, why is God um, sending frogs and lice and locusts and all of these weird things are happening? Well, what's the deal with that? Well, here's what you need to know. The plagues, those are the, that's a battle of the gods. Because Egypt worshipped many gods. They worshipped Heka, the frog-headed goddess. Geb, the earth god. Ra, the sun god, and so on. Each play was God claiming victory over those false gods. The tenth play, the final play, the Passover, right? We know about the Passover. The plague was that the firstborn son of every family would die. Now, why is that significant? Because the Egyptians set apart their firstborn son to um, service the gods, their false gods. So when God killed all of the firstborn sons of the Egyptians, he was claiming victory that he is the one true God. Amen? Amen. He is the one true God. Those ten plagues were the battle of the gods, and God was victorious. Now, throughout this uh, time of reading, you might have noticed that there was um, a, a statement that was made many times. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh being the, the king of Egypt, his heart was hardened. And I remember reading that, and, and it's, it's, it's talked about in the New Testament as well. And some of you may be a little bit confused, wondering, like, why does sometimes it say Pharaoh hardened his heart, and other times it says God hardened his heart? You ever wonder that? Is that ever thought ever come across to you? Like, you, you kind of wonder, wait a minute, what's going on with Pharaoh? Is, is he a puppet of God? Or does he have free will? Like, what's happening here with, with Pharaoh? So I wanted to clarify this. I read in my studies an article from the gospelcoalition.org. It mentioned a biblical axiom, a biblical truth. Revelation, here it is, revelation devoid of illuminating grace hardens sinful hearts. Maybe put a little better by Jesus in John 8, 45. He said, because I speak the truth, because I give revelation, you do not believe me. You harden your heart because you do not have illuminating grace. Think about that. The truth about God hardens hearts. There was no illuminating grace for Pharaoh. The plagues, in fact, forced Pharaoh to reveal his heart, put him on trial, his heart. And that's how God hardened it. The same sun that melts the wax can harden the clay. The same sun that melts the wax can harden the clay. If God's grace has melted your heart, say thank you, Jesus. I say thank you, Jesus, that my heart was softened by God's grace. Now, the way out is possible. All the people had to do now was plunder, pack, and press on. Right? They got to plunder the Egyptians, pack it up, and move on out. The shortest distance to the promised land. This begins the third 40 years of Moses' life. What's the shortest distance from where they're at to the way of the Philistines? Let's bring up the map one more time. The actual shortest way back the way that they came in is actually right across the top, right underneath the Mediterranean Sea. That would have been the shortest distance to um, the uh, Promised Land. But it's the way of the Philistines. And God doesn't take them that way because he knows those people. He knows his people. What would they do when they approached those evil, ruthless Philistines? They would have headed right back. <laughs> they would have tuck their tail under their legs, and they would have been right back in Egypt. We're sorry, take us back, the Philistines are mean, so on and so forth. Nope, they didn't go that way. God didn't take them that way. Instead of going east, he went south, right? And this is what we call the traditional route of the Exodus. You know, I know it's a traditional route, because it says it on the map right here. Traditional route of Exodus. 
all right? When they stopped, if you, want, if you follow the Gulf of Suez there, which is the Red Sea, if you follow that all the way up to where that red line crosses, that's where they um, uh, presume that they crossed the Red Sea, if you will. Okay, a portion of the, of the Red Sea going up all of that way. <coughs> they stopped there. They were pinned there, actually. The Egyptians changed their mind. They came after them. Right? And we had this, of course, you've seen the Ten Commandments, which many of you raise your hand, you know, that they're, they're stuck here, and, and the Egyptians are after them. And uh, the miracle, the party of the Red Sea takes place. 2.1 million people walk through it. The Egyptians follow. The sea swallows them up. The Egyptians are dead. And the people are free once and for all. Praise God, right? Amen. But here's what you must know. There is no way out without blood and power. There is no way out without blood and power. Let's go back to the Passover. The Passover involved the blood of a lamb. Before the tenth plague, before God took all of the firstborn sons in the land, right? He established the Passover. So these Israelites had to sacrifice the perfect lamb, take the blood, paint it on the doorpost of their front door. When the angel of death came through that night, he passed over the houses that were protected by the blood of the Lamb. To get through that Red Sea, they needed the power of God to defy the laws of nature. God split the sea, and they walked right through it on dry ground. And the enemy was killed in the process. The old was done away with. The new had come. These two extraordinary acts which provided the way out, points to Jesus Christ in every way. You see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament points to Jesus. In fact, just a few Sundays ago, I preached on Hebrews, a message called Jesus is Better. I shared this verse in Hebrews 9.22. Under the law, everything is purified with blood. Because that's what life is. It's in our blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And what does Peter point out? Peter, a disciple of Jesus, he says, The precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. And what does John the Baptist say when he sees Jesus walking by? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God. There is no way out unless Jesus shed his blood for your sins. Think about that. There's no way out unless Jesus shed his blood for your sins. You want forgiveness? Jesus is the way. He's the only way. You want heaven? Jesus is the only way. You want a great life? Jesus is the only way. Through the blood of Jesus. Then there's the power. In Philippians, Paul exclaims in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The power that split the Red Sea and resurrected God's people to no longer be slaves. That's the same power that resurrected Jesus after he was crucified and death lost its sting. By our human nature, we are slaves to sin. There's no way out unless Jesus was resurrected for you. Was Jesus resurrected for you? If so, you are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If I only had to time that, that booming noise, that would be great, wouldn't it? Then I could really, really get you. It's a little off timing with that right there. There's no way out without blood and power, and there's no way out without Jesus. In fact, I love this. In reading this, um, I, I read through uh, an electronic version of the Bible because it's got a concordance uh, tied into it, and it references other verses. And so when I was reading through it, I discovered in Hosea 11.1, 1, Hosea 11.1, 1, Hosea is a prophet, he actually wrote about this time. He says, when Israel was a child, when they, when they were growing up in Egypt, I loved them. And out of Egypt I called my son. Referring to the firstborn sons. They made it out. 
because of the Passover. But this was all prophetic. Matthew points this out in his gospel when he says that Jesus came out of Egypt. How is that possible? Well, Joseph and Mary had to take him down there because Herod was trying to kill all the boys. Because he heard about Jesus. He heard about the Messiah was coming. So they went and hid in Egypt. And out of Egypt comes the Messiah. Prophecy written by Hosea. Jesus is the Messiah. What does the Messiah mean? <clears throat> Promise, deliver. There's no way out without Jesus. If you have yet to put all of your faith in Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. Because there's only one thing that makes you right with God. I wish everyone could hear this. There's only one thing that makes you right with God, and that's your faith in Jesus. Three questions I have for you. Do you believe he shed his blood for you? Do you believe God raised him from the dead with his power? And do you believe he is the Son of God? If you say yes to those, you're right with God. You are right with God. And you have walked right through the Red Sea. But don't stop there. I think God has a wonderful plan for you. And uh, it should not involve wandering in the desert. If only the movie ended with those, with God's people walking through the Red Sea <laughs> and, and then like all movies, off into the sunset. All right? Unfortunately, um, they didn't do that. They should have gone right into the promised land. Would have been a short, wonderful journey. But those uh, people were quick to forget what God has done. And um, if they would have just trusted God, you wouldn't have to read numbers this week. Because <laughs> in numbers, they're just going to wander around for 40 years. But we can learn a lot from that. We're going to see when you read through numbers, we're very similar as we tend to wander in our walk with God. So promise me you'll come back next Sunday and, and get... Um, the comfort of knowing that when we trust in God on a daily basis, we can enter the promised land. Will you come back next week? Yes. yes.